Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm Mary Conley Eggert, the founder of Global Waterworks and your tour guide for the next hour. We'll be checking out the future of water. It's commonly said, many of you have heard, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. The reality is Israel has provided us with a glimpse of a brighter future, innovating from the start to ensure water was available for a nation created in a day in a desert. Its water technology innovation and management processes have changed the game for every country its hydrologists have reached out to help. And now you can take a front row seat with the game changers. A few technical items I just wanted to go over first is that uh, you can enter any questions you have into the question box. You'll be on mute until um, uh, through the conference due to the number of participants in our program, but uh, we don't want you to um, um, be concerned because you'll have plenty of time here uh, shortly to share your questions with the experts. And uh, we're very excited about um, the folks we have with us, as we mentioned, uh, they are game changers and uh, they are making water visible, personal, and connecting uh, stakeholders to water to make a bigger impact. Many of you have seen or heard of Dr. Femaletti, whose work on the NASA GRACE project has mapped out the future of water. Dr. Femaletti is a director of the Global Institute for Water Security and a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. He is regularly sought out for insight and will deliver one of the keynotes at this year's WATEC, talking about both food and water. And uh, Felicia Marcus, recent chair of the California Water Board, helped California achieve 24% water savings during an eight year drought by making water personal. She was also instrumental in overseeing the Israel California Memorandum of Understanding that led to 19 Israel technology pilots. And she is returning to WATEC with us for a second time and the fifth anniversary of that MOU. And Melissa Meeker helped uh, lead the digital transformation of utilities in South Florida, uh, where she headed up the South Florida Water Management Association. And then she signed on as the executive director of the Water Reuse Association, one of the fastest growing water opportunities in our nation. Stay tuned to learn about her next game changer, which should benefit everyone on this call and this is the new reveal i'm told so um last but not least we have our israel uh, organizers uh, ari goldfarb is joined by gilly elkin and aaron bonder who are uh, chairs of israel watek and uh ari is actually a waterpreneur in his own right uh, with a company called can do that, that does real-time pollution monitoring and uh, extracts fees or revenues from that from violators. It's a beautiful business model. But Ari will start us off with a glimpse of what Israel has to offer and what you can experience at WATEC. Hello, thank you, Mary. That's great introduction. So um, my name is Ari Golfa from Kandu in Israel. And I, I'm together here with the, uh, one of the biggest leaders of water in Israel, Oren Blonder from uh, The Road, and Gilly Elkin from uh, ICI. Um, just a, a background about, uh, uh, about WATEC in Israel. So WATEC is a water conference uh, that we have in Israel every two years. Uh, this WATEC is very special because this year we are going to focus on the what the future in water and the future of innovation technologies of uh, uh, the technology uh, that Israel can offer. Uh, the, uh, as you know, Israel is leader in in, in the uh, water technologies, and we want to show and to demonstrate that to the visitors, but we also want to connect between the, the visitors that will come from all over the world to the technology. And by, by uh, this is, the, we will do that by uh, first introducing the company. The company will show and introduce their future technology. So uh, not like at any other exhibition, in Watek, you will be able to see the future products of the company. So company will uh, show their future uh, uh, and demonstrate what they are planning to do. So you will have a glance uh, about what company in Israel are planning to do and how the water sector will look like in the near future. 
We will also have uh, uh, we will also have an interaction between the uh, audience and the, and the visitors and the company and as a B two B meetings and unofficial meetings between companies and uh, uh, and the visitors that will be done every day in the mornings uh, uh, um, um, by unofficial meetings like uh, visiting Tel Aviv, running at the beach and, and, and swimming at the sea together. We have a very, very interesting events that's combined between people and, and, and having a, a also a, a, a lot of fun around it. Um, it what we also planning to, to have is the uh, uh, the people to see the technology in action. So the last day of Watek actually will be site visits. The visitors can actually see the technology on site and meet the users, and 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 can see how we make change in the water uh, uh, sector in Israel by introducing new technology. Wow. Well, it sounds very worthwhile, and I can attest to that, having been there before. It's a, um, every trip to Israel is a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and I uh, totally unique. And for people in water, it's like going to Mecca. You will expand your network globally. Um, and Aaron, um, or, or and, I, and Ari and Gilly will be available for the Q&A period. So um, was there anything else right now, Ari, or team? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I think I think that uh, from our side, we are really eager to hear uh, the participants in this uh, webinar uh, at the Q&A. Um, well, we are too. And so uh, so thank you, Oren. We'll move right into that. Uh, what is a game changer? We don't want to use the label uh, haphazardly, but uh, Merriam-Webster defines it as a newly introduced element or factor that changes an existing situation or activity in a significant way. Nowhere is a game changer more needed than in water. Our informed audience is well aware of the need to rethink how we manage water and the energy in water. The reality is knowledge doesn't equal action. It takes inspired leaders, and we are dedicating this program to a game changer who tragically passed away this summer, Molly Green, founder of Water Mission International was an inspiration to us um, as Global Waterworks. She was a prayer partner and a mentor early on in our work. And she and her husband, George, founded Water Mission in 2001 after learning of the conditions in Honduras after Hurricane Mitch. And uh, since that time, Water Mission provided 4 million people in 55 countries with water, sanitation, and hygiene solutions. She is proof that one person can make a difference, and that change happens because great leaders know the way, show the way, and they go the way. With that in mind, I turn this program over to those who are leading the change, starting with Dr. Jay Femiletti. Thanks very much, Mary. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be on this panel, and, and I'm really looking forward to getting to the meeting in November. Um, I wanted to tell you, today about some of the work that I've been doing with satellites to track water availability around the world. And it really started when I was in grad school um, in the late uh, 1980s. So this is something that I've been thinking about and working on for a long time. It's still at it today. The work that's featured in this slide, and this will be the only slide that I show, this work actually started back in about 1997, 1998 with uh, one of my first graduate students, um, uh, named Matt Rodell, who's now uh, working at NASA at the Goddard Space Flight Center in, in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, and we started working on this concept back then. And this particular image that we're looking at here on the left side of this slide was only published in May of 2018. So we're looking at a solid 20 years of work. But what emerged from this, uh, from this work, I think is a very compelling picture of how freshwater availability is changing around the world. And, and it's this picture um, that has been driving what I do professionally for several years now. So let me briefly explain what, what we're looking at. This is a map that was produced using the NASA GRACE mission. GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Um, 
it launched in 2002, and, and this picture covers the time frame from 2002 through 2017. Um, the blue colors show the places that have been getting wetter since 2002, and the reds show the places that have been getting drier since 2002. The deep blues and the deep reds are what I call hot spots for either too much or too little water. So we can clearly see where all of the world's trouble spots are. And they include places like California, where Felicia Marcus and I work together, uh, and in Israel and in the Middle East, we'll be having the Watek conference. Much of what we are looking at is due to climate change. If you look at the top and the bottom of the map, we see the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are melting away. We look along the western coast of North America and South America. Some of those hotspots are related in Alaska, down in Patagonia. Some of those hotspots are related to um, uh, glaciers uh, melting in the mountains. Um, other things that show up really clearly are, are a number of these blue and red spots are due to changes in the extremes of flooding and drought, which are also driven by climate change. And a good example is right there in the center of North America and upper Missouri River Basin actually uh, heads up into Canada. And then around the uh, Aral and Caspian Sea regions uh, over in, in uh, Eastern, Eastern Europe, those are places that uh, have been drying out uh, in part because of drought, uh, but also because of, because of the drought, then there's been a lot more groundwater pumping. And then a number of those other spots are really driven by groundwater depletion in the world's major aquifer systems. If we look at uh, from, from west to east or left to right on this image, uh, California, that red spot there really corresponds to the Central Valley. The other red spot in southern United States is uh, the Ogallala or the High Plains aquifer. Uh, if we move across to the Middle East, the upper tier of the Middle East, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran uh, are drying out pretty quickly, as well as then down the Arabian Peninsula, uh, including Israel, Jordan, and, uh, and Palestine, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, moving across northwestern India, Bangladesh are just in really rough shape with respect to groundwater depletion. Uh, over near Beijing, we're looking at the depletion of the North China Plain aquifer. Uh, down in South America, not at the very tip, but the next red spot up from the south, that's the Huarani aquifer. Uh, uh, wow. So really when we look around the world, we're seeing that there's 37 major aquifers that we talk about globally and over half, but 20 of them are being rapidly depleted or they're past sustainability tipping points. So I really struggle with how to act on this. Um, as a professor, I don't have the platform that, say, uh, Felicia had when she was chair of the State Water Resources Control Board in California, or that uh, Melissa uh, had in Florida with the, with the South Florida uh, Water Organization. Um, so my approach has been really focused on communication, and that's, again, why I'm glad to be able to do this uh, webinar today and to, and to uh, be a speaker at the conference in November. Um, and so I've really tried to communicate in simple ways what we're seeing in this picture and what it means for society. And so I've been doing that, trying to do it at all levels. Could be to elected officials uh, in Washington, D.C. And now I'm about to make my first trip to Ottawa next week. Uh, I work a lot with the public. I do a lot of public speaking, but also write a lot of uh, opinion pieces. Um, and most recently, for example, I'm just back from World Water Week in Stockholm. Uh, I've been trying to make more connections with uh, the NGO world and with development banks. And all of this is to make sure that all of these people, whether it's the general public, whether it's a decision maker, uh, I really want to make sure that they have the latest information uh, that's available. There is some tremendous technology. Uh, in my field with respect to uh, satellites and aircraft and now even drone, drones, we can do a lot with monitoring water from, uh, from space to get that big picture view. So I do want to make sure that the people that are making decisions know what the satellites are seeing and know what that means for them locally, 
and regionally and, and globally. Um, you asked us a question before we kind of kid around uh, about whether we're sort of half empty, half full. Um, and so, you know, I really come down in the half in the half empty camp, uh, but I do need, uh, you know, I love working with people that are half full, like Felicia Marcus, who's going to speak next, because again, I, you know, I'm frustrated and I don't have access to, uh, uh, to policy or policy innovations. Uh, so I'm really enjoying hearing from our, or will enjoy hearing from our other panelists and the tremendous work that they're doing, trying to move the needle on regional and global water security. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, very good overview. We love the way you're putting data to use and uh, we're delighted to have uh, Felicia talk about the glass half full. Well, wow. That I'm sorry, I'm still focusing on Greenland in that picture. Um, which is pretty frightening. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to follow Jay, who's one of my heroes. Um, his work, his visuals, his energy really helped bring California water issues from the domain of inside experts, which a lot of us fancy ourselves as, but uh, I think that's a mistake, to an issue of collective public concern that actually created amazing political momentum for action. I'm gonna explain that in a minute. To give you a little bit of our setting, uh, it's obviously a longer story than I can share this morning, and many of you may have read about it, but basically California went through the worst drought in our modern history, meaning our recorded history over the past 100, 150 years or so. And over that period, we had had a cycle, a drought cycle of more or less three to, three to four years at most. And our, our whole system is built around highly variable hydrology. So we're, we're prepared for some of this. It doesn't rain and snow evenly each year. It doesn't fall in the places where it's most needed and it doesn't fall in the season of greatest use. So we do have a massive storage and series of storage and conveyance projects that capture water in the short wet season and receive snow melt then in the spring that replenishes our reservoirs, our streams and restores groundwater basins as much as it can. So we're built to handle three or four dry years, but these were beyond anything we'd seen by early 2014, the governor had declared a drought and issued a series of initial emergency orders. By 2015 in the spring, there was no snow at all, where usually there would be feet of snow, uh, which we now know was our worst snowpack in um, 500 years. And if you look at the chart at the bottom left, that little teeny red dot is all the snowpack we had in 2015. The whole chart gives you an idea of the ups and downs that we see from year to year, but that one was really a, a doozy. And during the depth of the drought, we had half a million acres of fallowed farmland, tens of thousands of people out of work. We had thousands of people whose wells had run dry and fish and wildlife were being hammered. And we had reservoirs drawn down to frightening proportions, including Folsom, which you see on the upper left, which is the major reservoir for the whole metropolitan region of Sacramento. Um, we had folks in rural communities you see on the far left who had to rely on bottled water that was trucked in by the government and by strangers. Um, they are people who had been relying on tainted water for a long time. And oddly enough, the fact that they were out of water got more attention to the issue um, than uh, the, the, the lousy water they'd been drinking for a long time. But all that is changing. So we had to, as a board, make all kinds and, and other departments heart-wrenching decisions about water deliveries to urban California and to agricultural California and to maintaining the survival of the ecosystems that also needed water. We put out over a billion and a half dollars of grants and loans into taking recycling projects from the drawing board to construction, and we delivered water to struggling communities and families in bottles and tankers and ran pipes and dug wells. We delivered food boxes, we streamlined permitting, and we passed a host of legislation I won't get into. But two of the biggest successes involved not the insider baseball, but involved the passage of historic groundwater legislation and the urban public's response to cut back their water use by 25%, which is what Mary asked me to talk about. I mentioned them together, not just because Jay is on, but because action was possible because we were able to break through in the media that business as usual was not gonna cut it and took the conversation from that insider game to a very public and personal game, uh, starting with uh, Governor Brown repeatedly saying, we're all in this together as Californians. And it really resonated, even in a big state of 39 million people, the fifth largest economy in the world and a huge geographic span. It could be 
five other states stacked on each other. So it's not the easiest place as a result to get a message through to people about public policy issues. Add to that that more than half of Californians live hundreds of miles from where their water comes from and they don't really know where it comes from because it's coming from this artificial and very productive system of storage and conveyance. Some have groundwater, some don't. Some have surface water, some don't. Uh, most of them have a mix of sources. So it, it's a miracle of social and economic development unseen in history that so many can take safe and affordable water for granted. But the flip side is that it's not easy to message the need to change course for the long term or a, a high risk possibility of a drought lasting longer than uh, it had in the past. And that was our problem. We knew we had this three or four year drought cycle that we had planned beautifully for, but we also knew from the geophysical evidence that we had had 40 and 400 year droughts in the past. And we knew from Australia's experience who had had that same three to four year drought cycle for the same hundred or so years that they had gone through their own millennial drought that lasted a decade or more. Um, and so they said, you know, save early because you never know when it's going to happen. So um, we, we saw agencies that had done a really good job in recycling conservation and, uh, and storage, growing storage groundwater and above ground since our last big three year droughts in the early 90s and the mid 2000s. Um, going on as if it was only be a three or four year drought. So the governor made a huge pitch and a huge call uh, to save 20% at the beginning of the drought. And we got kind of a tepid response from the agencies who were the ones who were mostly in uh, connection with the public. And eventually as he stood on that dry field where there should have been feet of snow, he issued an executive order calling for us to actually do a regulation um, getting to 25%, which was a, a heavy lift and not very popular with a lot of agencies, fairly popular with the public. We tiered it so it would be fair, so that folks that used a lot less would have lower percentages, as low as 4%, and those that used more would have percentages that were higher, up to 36%. But we also knew that over half of urban water use was on outdoor ornamental landscaping. So we knew we could do it. And to make a long story short, it, the, the key point of the regulations was that it got the agencies in gear, but it also helped people know that we really were going to be all in this together and not just relying on voluntary efforts because folks really want to step up. I had learned that in local government and recycling and other work I had done. They want to be asked, but they want it to be fair. So the messages that we went out, we messaged the collective issue a lot. We're all in it together. You see the Caltrans signs that were up on all the roads, public service announcements, including from our you know, top two basketball players in California with the Warriors, Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, who are known as the Splash Brothers. Um, we had websites up and uh, the Department of Water Resources put up templates that local agencies could just download so they didn't have to spend a lot of money on their messaging. Uh, water agencies, once they actually had a mandate, unleashed their own programs. Um, which were awesome in Southern California between the Metropolitan Water District and local water agencies, over a half a billion dollars went out uh, for rebates to folks who wanted to change out their lawns and they were snapped up in every batch of them. They were snapped up within weeks and you started to see a transformation in the landscape. We banned certain very visible uses like uh, watering outdoor um, watering medians and hosing down sidewalks and a bunch of other things that were very visible. We also put out data every month on every single large agency, how much they used, how much they were saving compared to 2013 when the drought was uh, declared, just before the drought was declared. We made it really easy for the media to write stories by putting those numbers out so they had something to work with. We did monthly briefings on everything that was going on. Um, and the media also did lots of very touching stories on the small communities that were out of water which actually touched the hearts of people all over the state and led to all kinds of legislation we don't have time for today that's helped us be in a much better place to help those folks with water as well as actually getting sustainable water to thousands of people with thousands more to go. Um, and meanwhile, Jay's visuals, and you see in the middle top, uh, one of them about the Central Valley groundwater basin and just the change over a period of years made the point not just about the drought itself but about how particularly in the central valley 
farmers had pumped so much additional foundational water to grow more that the ground was sinking in an ever accelerating way. And those photos really brought it home and made it possible for the media to write a lot of good stories, along with stories about infrastructure buckling and groundwater basins collapsing to the point where they couldn't be refilled for the future, et cetera. And this is the hardest issue to elevate, no pun intended, because it's literally underground. And I think, it, just as a shout out to Jay, it rang alarm bells the public got and the public called for, which meant politicians had to act. And we finally got, we're the last state in the nation to get groundwater management at the state level. And it took 100 years from the surface water one. And Jay is really the, the hero of being able to do that. Polls started showing the public would save water to help farmers, to help people without water, and help fish and wildlife. And, and this is the more personal part, really personal for me, because it was a little uncomfortable, and it's where the lesson comes in, I think, for all of us who are water experts, particularly the technical ones, is the governor's office, without asking me, incidentally, put me out as a spokesperson who was relatable to people for profiles which were very uncomfortable, and as the explainer-in-chief in the media, I wasn't super comfortable with that, but it's what we needed to do. And I'm an extrovert and the water board was on point for drinking water, recycling, all kinds of things we did and water rights. And we had very public hearings every two weeks. I had people talking to me in grocery stores about asking their teenagers to take shorter showers, sending me pictures of their of leaking sprinklers next door, proposals for towing icebergs and everything you can think of. And kept being introduced as the water czar or the face of the drought, which I really didn't like that one. Um, and personally, I kind of preferred drought girl, but it, it was something we needed to do to personalize it to an us rather than the abstract that those of us in the water world frequently are more um, comfortable with. And in closing, the coolest thing about it was that the public rose to that challenge, challenge once there was the framework and the call and they hit it out of the park saving you know 24 percent over where they'd been in 2013 and even with the torrential rains in the years since fortunately we didn't get that 10-year drought um over half of the savings have stuck and so once learned people learned they didn't have to keep overwatering their lawns and that uh, it's hard to kill a lawn and we were able to even get long-term efficiency legislation passed which now will have uh, per capita targets and um, outdoor targets, depending on climate and uh, irrigable, irrigable acreage that will be integrated into planning for the future, which will save a lot of greenhouse gases and the need to do more facilities sooner, et cetera. So a, a huge win, and it was made possible by this very personal and visible effort. Um, so the message is really to remember real people and not underestimate them to share information and not be afraid to ask them to step up, uh, which is hard for experts. So I'm happy now to pass the baton to Melissa, who's an international leader in water innovation, who I've known in different roles and who really helps us all be a lot better. Yes, and as we do, I also want to come back to you, Felicia, for your story on involving the Israel hydrologists in uh, the water changes, some of which uh, impacted California. Great. Thanks for being part. Thank you to Melissa. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Felicia. You know, I, I feel so really blessed to be included on this panel and to follow such incredible leaders and game changers. Felicia in particular was such a tremendous leader in California. And I'm, I'm Felicia, I'm just happy to hear you on this call and happy to hear that you're still advocating for these these critical issues. It's 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 great to be here with you. You know, we we have some colleagues uh, that do a, a really a really great podcast, and one of the questions they always ask their guests is if if they chose water or if water chose them. And I I've never had any doubt that I would work in or around water. So I'd like to think that water chose me long before I even thought about what I was going to do when I grew up. Um, and uh, you know, it's just grown from there into really a resource management kind of focus. It, with my first emphasis being on water quality and quantity and ultimately diversification of those water supplies. Um, and I, I think where I am right now in my career is really as a utility advocate that's going to pull together as many people as possible to focus on resilient water supplies and, and our future solutions to these critical problems. Um, I think as we, as we look at um, 
water supply and having enough water supply for our local communities. Um, I've never really shied away from a challenge, and I think that's one of the great things about the water industry itself. Even failure is better than no action at all. Um, and I think most times there's some there's something that needs to be done. And I, I think it's great that we've been able to um, really uh, bring together uh, all of the different parties around the water industry to focus on things such as diversification of water supplies and the implementation of reuse. You think about where we've come in the last really five to six years in terms of uh, water supply and water reuse implementation. There were cities who would never even consider reuse who are now implementing phenomenal projects. Yes, there was a drought behind that. Yes, you just heard Felicia um, and Jay talk about uh, stressed water supplies. But I'd also, I'd like to think that that progress is because we were able to tell a story and to focus on needed research in key areas to answer critical questions and really to bring people together to share their challenges and frankly their successes. Because we as an industry learn from each other um, and that connection through events like WATEC and other conferences and other uh, opportunities to really exchange those stories is so critical. When I think about how far we've come with reuse, I'll say it wasn't easy. Um, and as you just heard Felicia talk about as well, it's just, it, it was a very hard struggle to get where we are today, and we're certainly not done. Um, but when you think about water reuse, everyone always points to public perception as the greatest obstacle. And I, I think the message that the previous two speakers talked about and, and how personal these issues are um, really takes things a long way. The public just wants and deserves transparency. And there are successes where utilities have been open and honest and have their communities full support in their wide variety of uh, water supply projects that they have. I think there's strong similarities sort of to take that reuse lesson that we have um, and apply that to technology innovation on the utility side. Utilities want to see transparency. They, they have their challenges. Um, but if we tell the story, and by this I mean if the utilities tell the story about what their struggles and what their challenges are, then our technologies can address those um, and they can become more comfortable with them through demonstrating and developing solutions and then letting people share and train off those solutions. So I'm confident that uh, we'll be successful sort of translating those reuse successes to uh, a stronger focus on technology innovation. And I don't think we're ever done. You know, there's no, I had uh, someone ask me, when do you know you've succeeded? Well, you don't. We just keep moving the goalposts further down the field. And I, I think it's, that's one of the reasons why it's so critical for us to continue talking, even when we don't feel comfortable talking about things publicly, but continue talking to each other, increase your network, and a great way to do that, again, is through, through events like the one coming up in Israel. And any chance we have to come together and really focus on solutions to problems, we're going to make progress. I think another uh, critical point in terms of change and changing our industry is that there's a time and a place for everything. And it's critical for us to leverage the right time for real success. And again, I think the, the drought and the implementation of reuse projects is a, is a great example of that. Never, never let a good disaster go to waste. You know, we, we capitalized on that and really pushed uh, technology to address that solution. So we developed those solutions based on the challenges of the day. Um, and um, I think it's, it's just because one of the challenges that we have, again, as a utility advocate is that Every day I get a phone call for a new technology. This is what we can do for you. This is what we can do for you. And the challenge that we have is that the solution should really be driven by what the utility needs. So let me tell you what challenges we have as utilities and then adapt your solution to address those challenges. And I think that will also help, help our industry, which is why I'm so excited to introduce The water tower. 
Oops, it disappeared. <laughs> we are we are kicking off a uh, an innovation hub um, in Gwinnett County. It will actually be a nonprofit, but I'm really excited about it. Uh, the relationship with the county, they're giving us access to land. They're building our first building, um, and then we'll, the nonprofit will expand from there in order to really focus on um, the uh, demonstration and development and visualization of technologies that will help move our water utilities to the next level. So it's, it's, although it's right now in Gwinnett County, our aspirations are to be global. Um, and our focus is going to be on four key areas. You're all familiar with really phenomenal education centers at specific utilities or in certain areas or a, or a demonstration facility at a specific university. But really, we're trying to hit all four key components. And to me, those are applied research, technology, innovation, demonstration, and equally as important, visualization workforce development, and stakeholder engagement. So we're going to do that by developing a campus. This uh, uh, picture just shows you one uh, little piece of the campus. The campus actually will have up to 10 buildings as we develop over time. Um, and we'll include a mix of private, public, nonprofit entities that want to create an ecosystem. And this ecosystem will really focus on supporting new ideas and solutions, creating a pipeline for the workforce, I like to say from GED to PhD, um, have active engagement of the public. As you can see, it'll be a beautiful place to go, and we can um, highlight new technologies and it help them understand why, you, why utilities have to do things like raise rates, um, but also engage the public, policymakers, utilities, service providers, and manufacturers. So just a, a really exciting uh, opportunity that we have to take this portion of the industry to the next level. Uh, it is really beautiful, Melissa. Great vision, a great way to uh, really um, summarize what you all are doing, making water visible, personal, and connected. And uh, uh, we're delighted to have everyone here for the Q&A. People can add their questions to um, the question box or, um, or in the chat window if you'd like. And um, I have, uh, I, I think there are some people you can also raise your hand if you have a question and our administrative team will help out there. So um, just a question as a follow-up, uh, Felicia, on yeah. California's involvement with uh, the MOU. I know that's where you and I met and it's a five-year anniversary this year, but you, in, you involved Israel for what reason and what was the, uh, the experience? Well, it was fabulous actually, I mean, we really look to Israel as the art of the possible and for inspiration in a lot of ways. I mean, in, in some ways, the Australia is more similarly situated in some ways than we are, particularly on some of the ecosystem river issues. But Israel was the art of how you uh, uh, work a miracle in water in the sense of having a, a much more challenging setting and yet managing in a relatively short period of time to turn it around into an asset, including an asset for diplomacy. So it, no one could say here that uh, things couldn't be done because Israel had already done them. And I think it inspired us in a lot of ways um, to be way more aggressive on conservation and recycling, um, uh, to, to set standards for recycling, but also standards for desal, which, um, fit with our uh, particular milieu and ocean management regime because project had been stalled for so long, really elevating the role of technology and putting um, money aside for it. And we saw just some incredible work going on. There was a, a trip that brought a lot of folks from agriculture to Israel as part of it, but really just um, some of the I, I sort of charismatic megafauna or the charismatic um, leaders, for example, at Netafim, um, about drip irrigation and the art of the possible um, in agriculture, um, looking at the uh, Carlsbad facility that's been built in um, San Diego and Santa Barbara, um, the whole raft of technologies around metering and sensors and leak detection and the like that, um, you know, made us realize how leaky and uh, inefficient our systems are that also led to legislation and regulations coming on 
leakage and the like, but just the energy around the technology and the fact that we now have this ability with sensors and big data and linking things together to actually deal with these issues even more economically than we might have thought. I think um, we just started with that. I think in this administration with a new governor who is the data technology um, king of all time, I think there's a tremendous opportunity to really expand on the, the partnership. But I, I think the, the other thing that we were encouraged by Israelis to just take bold action and not be timid. And again, uh, water in California culturally, I, I, I talked about a little bit, but I really didn't get into it. It's very, very slow moving compared to the other places where we might be cutting edge on quality, for example. On managing water, we're very fragmented with thousands of agencies and very localized. I've got mine. Don't, you know, talk to me kind of a culture of insiders. And Israelis were, you know, dumbfounded by how inefficient our system was, and it was it was a kick in the pants, I think, to take bolder action. We we haven't overcome that fragmentation issue as beautifully as Israelis have, but you got to walk before you can run. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful story, and I think uh, the momentum is there with the successes. If we can share those, and that's a question we have for uh, Melissa. Um, how can we, um, and it's from Nutish Dilov, um, who's involved with the reuse organizations, how can we increase adoption of centralized and decentralized water reuse applications for corporates and utilities? Any ideas? It's for Melissa. Well, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think we're, I, we're seeing... Uh, those options considered at uh, utilities all over. Um, you know, the, the decentralized piece is, is I don't want to say relative new, if, if reuse is five to six years, and I know it goes much longer than that, but actually potable reuse and the strong discussions about that, decentralized is, you know, two years, three years. Um, but I do think that there's been a lot of work um, by the Water Reuse Association and before that the U.S. Water Alliance on decentralized systems and how they can fit into an entire system. There's been great advances on technologies in this space. Um, you know, there's some operational things that I think utilities are worried about, but I think they're definitely um, things that we can overcome and that we can address as we think about operations and management plans and who actually manages the systems and those kinds of things. So I think we're going to see more progress in those areas. And I think anything we can do to create a diversified system um, is going to greatly benefit our utilities and communities as we move forward. Yes, agreed. And I think at next week's reuse um, summit that you'll all be at in California should be another energizer um, that um, one of the most well attended events, I think, in water. So um, I know you're headed there. And uh, curious um, of the entire panel, um, if you were starting your career today, what would you do differently that may help someone in the next generation manage water better? Jay, maybe you could start. Um... You know, I think um, if I go back to my uh, time in college, uh, more interest in policy early, <laughs> early on, I think um, could help. You know, there's always, uh, we get into our towers, we're scientists, we're engineers, or we're, you know, we do political science or social science or something. We don't cross over enough. So I think having that crossover into the social sciences, understanding uh, how policymakers think, understanding something about economics, I think is really important for scientists and engineers who, you know, know there's a problem and 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 think that, you know, we we sort of fall into the trap of thinking that the science is everything, but the science is only one part of a, a decision. So I think the more that uh, people know about that earlier in their careers, they can figure out how to find a path through and, and be more effective. Yeah, excellent point. And Felicia? Well, it's hilarious because I would say the same thing, except I should have taken more science and math classes um, <laughs> so that I would have been able to translate a little bit better. I think I I shied away from it the way many people do, thinking, you know, if you're stronger in uh, in uh, words, you go be a lawyer like I did and you uh, avoid math. And I think I I lost a lot that I've been trying to catch up on with my sort of love of engineers and scientists. And my whole career has pretty much been creating a bridge between them and regular people. 
um, because of that. So I totally agree with Gray's, with uh, Jay's advice. And I think for those of us who've shied away from math and science, we should do the opposite, which is get more into that mindset. And we all should, we all should do our Myers-Briggs so we can translate personalities between the science and tech mind and the the fuzzy policy mind and if the two when we're paired together you know the sky's the limit uh, i love your you two are just yin and yang it'll be perfect in israel so <laughs> <laughs> a full science policy and uh, and i want to uh, melissa you can comment on what the next generation but we also want to hear about your israel innovation at uh, your your demonstration facility the water tower yeah i guess if for me, it's uh, it, it's silos as well. But I was thinking about silos differently, you know, in a, in a utility or in the in at the Water Reuse Association. Your your silos are really based on water, wastewater, stormwater, and thinking and having an expertise in a specific area. When as a civilization, we need to think about wa all water, and it's it is all one water. So we need to think about things that way. Uh, you know, I'm really excited uh, as we approach Watec that our first demonstration out of the box is actually an Israeli company um, who has partnered with Adage, which is one of my local um, uh, local businesses here that does water treatment um, to look at uh, membrane technology that could, you know, one of the challenges we have with reuse in the inland areas is the use of RO. So this is a new membrane technology that could actually help us reduce uh, some of those challenges and, and further expand reuse inland, which will be a great thing. So just wanted to mention that. Rotec is the company. Yes, I'm very familiar with Rotec. They get an extra 20% um, out of reuse systems, reducing the brine, oh. which is a huge part exactly. of um, the challenge of doing RO and um, or of desalination. So, um, and I, I think uh, Graham has asked a, a question for Jay. Graham, could I just have you Ask that verbally. Sorry, there. I, I, I was just on on mute. I I, I loved uh, Jay's um, uh, graphic there, showing the uh, the uh, depletion of groundwater resources. And I was just wondering if there's a way to uh, or a plan afoot to downscale that from from global to to really a, a local level. Ooh. And the um, you know for for the reason that we're, we're making decisions based on, on very local resources and, and water tends to be quite quite local. And you know, we, we have to be able to get uh, that sort of broad scale um, view down to like may, maybe even individual aquifer or sub aquifers within, the, within um, existing groundwater sources. Um, thanks, thanks, Graham. So um, most of the work that so that's a critically important question. One of the things I didn't really talk about is that the resolution, and you can see it from that image that I showed, is pretty coarse. Um, so it's not, you know, it's really good for like Felicia was saying for like motivating the the general public over over a big area like the state of California, but it's not going to help, you know, I lived in Orange County for a while, you know, it's not gonna help people at the Orange County Water District make any decisions. Um, the, so it needs to be downscaled or uh, put it a little bit differently. We need to be seeing the same, the same information at a higher resolution. Um, most of what's happening in the downscaling realm is happening in the research world. Uh, I had a student named Michelle Myro write a paper, and I can send that to you, Graham, if you send me a, a, um, a, your email address on downscaling to uh, one kilometer. Um, and so it would be very effective uh, then, you know, for exactly the purposes you were talking about. Just for other listeners, what the downscaling means is you, you basically have to combine the grace, the coarse resolution of the grace data on its own, own means that you has it 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 doesn't it, it needs other it needs to be combined with other information at higher resolution um, and those could be for example data sets on regional soil patterns data sets on regional precipitation patterns uh, data sets on actual groundwater levels to help us understand and sort of break down and downscale and add value to the coarse resolution data to bring it to a higher resolution and then be able to support um, uh, decisions 
water management decisions at the scale at which they're actually made, which could be a watershed, it could be a could be an aquifer district. Uh, so yeah, Graham, if you send me uh, uh, an email, I can send you a couple of papers on that topic. Yeah, that's wonderful. We'll provide emails um, to everyone. And we'll actually post that for everyone, Jay, if that's okay. Okay, sure. I, I think that's what this whole community is about, is sharing and uh, collecting, um, collaborating and celebrating the good work going on. And we've set up a special community that all of you can join, which I'll um, point to in a moment. It's at Global Waterworks Connect, gwwconnect.com. But um, but I wanted to get back. I know Israel had mentioned the next generation of hydrologists is what we will be able to meet when we're in Israel. And maybe Ari and Oren could uh, speak to uh, what they're seeing in the next generation and what their hope for the next generation. So calling on Ari and Oren, it's, it's I think uh, 9.50 in Israel, so it may be a little little late. Hope you're still with us. Maybe I'm mute. Hey, uh, uh, Mary, can you hear me? Am I am I unmuted? I yes, no, you're good, Jay. Um, I just wanted to add, so while we're waiting for Ari to, to reappear, I forgot to add something pretty important. That downscaling work with Michelle actually grew out of a visit that we made to Israel in 2013, and our uh, initial collaborators were some of the scientists at Mekarot. Oh, cool. Oh, wonderful. That is is great, and a reason to go, I think, Jay, we mentioned the one-on-one -on -one meetings. They have wonderful B2B meetings you can set up with uh, mm -hmm. the leaders in um, in treatment, in reuse, in desal, in uh, leak detection from satellites, and they've mm -hmm. managed to reduce leaks to um, le under 9% and to increase reuse to 90%, even over that, uh, leading the world, uh, literally. So um, uh, that's a great insight. And Ari, I see you're back on. I think he was back on. And so we'll uh, we'll wait for him to join. I'll keep an eye out for that. But uh, but I think uh, the other question I had was, uh, what are you all most excited about seeing or doing in Israel? So starting with you, Jay. Well, so I, I think just following up on that last comment, uh, really understanding some of the needs of the of the people there, um, and sort of reflecting on, you know, before I moved uh, here to Canada, I worked at NASA for four years, and I've always done NASA research as we as we talked about um, today. Uh, and so I really like the opportunity to sort of reflect on some of the uh, exhibitor or participant needs and what's emerging from the satellite technology. We can, we're always moving towards higher and higher resolution uh, and we can do th things across multiple scales. It doesn't have to be satellites. It could be aircraft and it can be drones. Uh, it could be mounted on a boom in a, in a field or it could be in a laboratory. Uh, so I'd kind of like to explore that space and find out how we can how we can help. Oh, I think that's a wonderful reason to go. They are also the startup nation, the entrepreneurs around the world, uh, and so have many different mobile technologies and communications technologies to tie to what you suggested. And uh, and Felicia, it's your second time, I believe, for what? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love the energy there and I do love the separate meetings and the how easy they make it to do it. But I think speaking of the young people, I mean, I go to a lot of water conferences as um, I'm sure Jay and Melissa do, and the average age is pretty old generally in our world, except at WATEC. So you just see this energy and dynamism of a whole nother generation as well as the creativity and um, good humor of their elders and so it's a again this i'm the ecosystem manager rather than uh the ecosystem manager i just think it's a it's a wonderful water and people fest of um energy and ideas and 400 kinds of really good hummus <laughs> so important yes uh -huh. so uh we have another uh a friend on the call who actually uh joined me in israel last uh watek and uh, gigi you had a question and maybe you could comment on why you're most excited about returning to israel and i guess i shouldn't call yes, on people sorry, I just, sorry about that i was still on mute when i was talking 
I mean, first of all, I did join you at the last Watech, and it was absolutely fabulous. I think it's a great collection of lots of technological companies. Um, the there's tours of some of the most amazing utilities, very advanced utilities using these technologies, and I think the energy level, as everyone has pointed out, is is pretty high and and, and big vision on the future for water and water technology. So I'm really looking forward to coming back this year to Watech and seeing what everything, um, how everything has changed and we're moving forward in terms of um, greater efficiency and, and also bringing light to the water crisis um, across the world and showing how Israel handled it and hopefully the rest of the world can follow along. So, my, my question, of course, I've been very um, focused on digital twin technology. And Melissa, I know that the water tower is gonna play a very important role to bring together all of these digital technologies under more of a holistic type of management for utilities to bring greater efficiencies. And I think um, you know, demonstrating like digital twin technology is gonna be important as well as um, creating or transforming utilities to have more of an innovation type culture where every single staff member actually participates in bringing greater innovation towards their particular um, area of work within a utility. Do you have any comments on that? Just, just that I agree. I mean, to me, that's one of the phenomenal things about bringing together those four legs of the stool. And when you bring in that workforce piece, we're going to have operators walking through, you know, people who are, are getting their certifications. So they're the ones actually running the plants, letting them then walk through the demonstration facility where we're going to have this control room that shows how all the different technologies integrate with their GIS-based system or their SCADA-based system or show them how a digital twin could work is really, I think, going to jumpstart the implementation of digital technology at the utility level. I agree. I'm so excited to see this. Thank you. Yes, um, so many things to look forward to. And I think um, particularly with what's been organized in Israel, there is a video uh, of what happened at Watech 2017 that you can all see in uh, the uh, event materials. And uh, what we'd like to do is uh, encourage everyone to uh, to connect with the information we're going to share with you and uh, make it visible, use the data Jay has, refer to his work uh, so that all can know about the future of water and better manage our water. Make it personal, appeal to what's in it for the others, or as Felicia says, the ego in the ecosystem. And as uh, Melissa is doing, connect, collaborate, and celebrate. And uh, learn from Israel's example. Um, it's a uh, 70 years of innovation to uh, sustain a nation. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the benchmarks are leading the world and uh, the innovation mindset is truly uh, an energizing one as uh, our speakers have shared. So um, we, we welcome ongoing comments. Um, and uh, hope you will register for Watech Israel. Check out the website. They have a wonderful photo area where I mentioned they do have videos of what's gone on in the past. And uh, I, before we sign out, I just want to ask a final word from each one of the uh, panelists if they could share what, what you would like us to take away and uh, and leave with folks. So, well, shall I go first? Since my my picture is all the way on the left. Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, so I, I think my message is that uh, water security and food security are far greater risk than, than people realize. But I think in uh, listening to Felicia and to Melissa, uh, we understand that there's uh, lots of potential for solutions. Um, and so, uh, you know, I might be a glass half empty person, but, uh, but it's important to connect with, with people like this that are glass half full. Oh, so true, Jay, and glass half full. Felicia. Oh, no, I totally agree. You can't have one without the other. I think the ringing of the alarm bells um, so that people really realize how perilous a situation we are in um, for a variety of reasons, not least of which is accelerating all of these problems through climate change. You know, blessed are the messengers that help people understand this work. Um, and then it's also important to make clear to people that we actually can do something about it. It's not hopeless. Um, and that, you know, as Governor Brown said, we're all in this together and there's there are things we can do 
to avert the, the worst of what's to come. And I, it's really up to all of us to do it um, for ourselves, but also for uh, the next generation. So there's no time like the present to get in gear. Excellent advice. And Melissa? Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it, it takes a village and it's gonna take all of us and it's gonna take you know, manufacturers working with the service providers, working with utilities, working with entrepreneurs, working with policymakers, working together towards uh, what the future can be. And, and I think we have a great opportunity to do that. And I'm excited to engage with all of you to do that. Yes, wonderful. And everyone can see the Twitter handles for all of you, where I know you're you're very active. So we appreciate your keeping us apprised that way. And Ari and the team in Israel is back on with the last word. What would you like to see? Yes. Hi. So sorry for the technical challenges we have here. Um, so uh, I'm Ari again from Kandu. And as an entrepreneur, I only have a, ch a choice to see the empty glass. I don't have any other choice. So. What I see that the technology and innovation can change the game and can make the difference and can help us go to the next stages or, or to the next, next you know, to the future uh, and, and can bring us much better world in terms of water supply and sanitation. Yes, uh, it, it's a great showcase you're assembling for us in November, Ari, and we look forward to joining you there and uh, just really appreciate everyone joining in today's webinar. And as I mentioned, we are all about uh, connecting, collaborating, and celebrating. It, many of you are already part of our GWW Connect community, but uh, we curate uh, uh, stories, experts, best practices, and uh, technology solutions in hopes that people can get immersed and see the opportunities. And uh, um, any way we can help any of you, we're happy to uh, to do so. You can reach me at mary.eggert at Global Waterworks or at our Twitter handle, Global Waterwork. You are all part of making Global Waterwork. And uh, together, we do believe we can solve our challenges more quickly. Thank you for your time today and for the expert work. It's been a pleasure being with you all and uh, I'm truly inspired and look forward to working with you all to change the game for uh, the planet, for our people and uh, um, for all of us to prosper together. Good day. Thanks, Mary. Thanks. You, yep. See ya. Thank you and goodbye. Thank hey, you thank you, you. real team. Really appreciate you being here. Take care. I'll send a wrap up to everyone and you'll get that in your email and uh, you know where to reach us. Take care. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.